Hi everyone, welcome to today's video. So let me start today's video by telling you a very recent story from my life. So I was trying to buy an air conditioner and the cost of the air conditioner was around like 40,000. So I told the shopkeeper that give me your RTGS NEFT details, I will get the transfer done. He said, no, no, you should take a zero cost EMI option. That way I will be able to give you a discount of 1500 rupees. Now this is like absolute madness for the simple fact that one, I was willing to pay the entire amount up front. So I failed to understand that why I was being made to take a loan unnecessarily. So that is one. Second, I failed to understand the fact that why me taking a loan is useful for the firm. It is absolutely crazy. Think about it this way that if you are selling a product, would you want me to pay you 40,000 rupees today? Would you want to take that in eight installment of 5,000 rupees each? Which option would you like? So comment below and tell me. So think about it logically that what type of crazy world do we live in where people who do not need debt at all, for example, people who are rich, people who are slightly ultra rich, they do not need debt and they are getting free debt. People who are poor, who need debt actually, they are not getting any debt. People who are in the middle, the salaried middle class, they are getting crushed because they want loans, but they are getting very expensive loans. So this is a very complicated scenario. So this prompted me to study the situation more and come up with three specific points as to why the middle class bubble is getting created and why majority of the people due to these weird structures, weird streams will keep on staying in the middle class. So these are three middle class traps that you must avoid in order to migrate to that rich or ultra rich category. Super, super important video. Also along the video, I will reveal the answer whether I took that EMI or not. So let us get the discussion started. So two very important disclaimers before starting the video. So number one is the definition of middle class. When I say middle class, I mean it in a traditional sense, not in a financial sense. So middle class means people who are not completely financially free. They have to think a lot before undertaking any big ticket purchase. So that is the middle class I'm referring to. And if they become rich or ultra rich, then of course they don't have to think too much before buying a lot of stuff. Second is a big shout out to our sponsors for today, which is TaxBuddy. It is an excellent tax management platform it can help you with end-to-end -end tax filing regarding your GST, optimizing your tax returns and whether you are in the middle class or upper middle class or rich or ultra rich, you still need to optimize your taxes. So do check out TaxBuddy. It is a wonderful platform. So let us get the video started and I will speak about three reasons in detail as to why people get stuck in the middle class and what they need to do in order to escape this trap. So number one reason for people getting stuck in that middle class zone is because of lack of financial understanding. Now you would say that Akshat, oh big deal, you have disclosed something which is fairly commonsensical because in India we don't have financial education, schools don't teach us much about finance, therefore lack of financial awareness, therefore people struggle to invest, save money, what not, right? So what big deal you are telling? Okay, so do a little bit of thought exercise here and you will quickly realize that people struggle with their financial understanding of things on everyday basis. So let me ask you a simple question that how do you undertake spending decision? So let's imagine that you have to buy a 50,000 rupee product. How will you decide whether to buy that or not? Your assumption would be that, you know what, I will draw out like an Excel spreadsheet. I will write the pros and cons. Then I will draw all the assumptions. I will look at my bank balance. I will look at opportunity cost. Okay, that is highly academic. But what is the practical way of undertaking your spending decisions? Because seriously, ask yourself a simple question that these days people engage in impulse buying. You are going out shopping with your girlfriend or wife, etc. She might like a dress, you might like a t-shirt. Will you sit in a mall, open your laptop and start creating Excel spreadsheets? The answer is no. You will undertake an impulse buying decision. So the point people struggle in terms of making good financial decision is because they do not have simple frameworks. Let me help you in terms of making easy purchase decisions. If you can buy something twice without stressing about it, then you can definitely buy it once. And whether or not you should be buying or not buying, that is a separate discussion altogether, but at least this simple framework can help you improve your decision making. So if you like that tip, do press the like button. It will help this video reach out to more people. Now let me talk about more fundamental issue when it comes to financial understanding. And this has to do with the concept of understanding debt. 
Now, debt in simple terms means taking loans and majority of us struggle with the fact that should we be taking EMI, should we be taking home loan, should we be taking study abroad loan, etc, etc. I have already made several videos on it, so you can go and watch it. But today I am going to demonstrate a very simple framework to understanding whether or not you should be taking debt or not. That framework or concept is that if debt can produce cash flow, you should be taking debt. If the debt cannot produce cash flow, you should not be taking debt. Let me prove it through an example and then I will do a quick case study with you. So the example is of a house. For example, if you are taking debt to own a house, in majority of the cases, that is not a good investment. That you are taking 1 crore rupee debt from the bank, then you will have to keep on paying EMI. So what does that create? That creates a negative cash flow. So that is not a good use of debt. But on the flip side, if you are taking a debt to buy a commercial property, then of course you are not going to put a bed in your commercial property and start sleeping there. I hope that such a situation does not come. So the point being and going back to the concept that that commercial property allows you to create a cash flow because you will be making some kind of regular income from it by taking on debt. So that is how the rich or ultra rich used it. So let me present a very quick case study also. I'm sure that you know Mr. Donald Trump's damad. His name is Mr. Jared Kushner. In India also we have a damad. Let me know his name in the comment box. I will not name it. Otherwise it becomes like a political debate. But it is just fun. It would be fun for me to read your comments as to who you think is India's damad. So back to Donald Trump's damad story, which is Mr. Jared Kushner. So if you study about Mr. Jared Kushner's wealth creation, you will quickly realize that he has approximately 1 billion dollar in wealth and Kushners are big real estate mogul. They own ton of real estate all across America. Now here is a very quick article which talks about the point that Kushner companies paid 1.1 billion dollar for a portfolio of approximately 6,000 apartments in Maryland and Virginia. Now the natural question comes that why do these ultra elite people end up becoming real estate moguls or start out in real estate in America and become super rich? So here is the model explained in a very simple language that will teach you a very important lesson around taking debt. So the model here is fairly simple that the 6000 apartments that we were talking about it's not as if that Mr. Jared Kushner is buying that from cash flow. He would take a lot of debt. Debt means taking loans from banks like Bank of America etc etc and the same model also plays out in India. I am avoiding taking an Indian example because again there will be a lot of halla and all that. So I am taking Mr. Jared Kushner's example but you can apply that exact same model in India also. So step one take a lot of debt from banks. Number two, buy real estate. For example, Mr. Kushner bought 6,000 apartments. Third, now every apartment will be generating some cash flows, right? So they keep on becoming bigger and bigger in size as they more, more and more apartment, they will get more and more cash flows. Now, what does this becoming big? It has got to do with everything because this is what ensures the success of the model. The bigger you get, the cheaper debt you are able to avail. Now I can point to 20 big businesses in India that get cheaper debt compared to what you and I will be able to get. Now why do you think that Mr. Vijay Malya, why do you think that Mr. Nirav Modi took so much debt? It's not as if that they were enjoying taking debt because they could get debt at a dirt cheap price. Once you get massive amount of debt, you use that debt to keep creating and playing this loop. This is literally getting access to low cost money. So now comes the natural question that should we also try to become Donald Trump's damad? Now I cannot comment on that but you should definitely learn how to use debt intelligently even while being in the middle class. So how can you do that? So number one, please do not use debt for ridiculous purposes. For example, I'll do stock trading, I'll do crypto trading by taking on debt. Please don't do that. That is pretty much pointless. You can go broke. Number two, you should use debt in order to create cash flows. Now what fundamentally happens is and this is the economics behind it and I will give a very quick explainer here. So let us consider that if someone, some ultra rich or rich person takes 1 crore rupee of debt and let's imagine that you are saving 5 lakh rupees in your bank account. So that amount of 5 lakh rupee is stuck with your HDFC, ICICI bank account, you are keeping it there. Now where do you think this 1 crore rupee of extra money comes into the equation? Do you think that there is like that there is only a fixed amount of money that is given out from that pool of money? The answer is no. This 1 crore rupee of new money is actually printed right and is given to the person in form of a debt. That is how the Keynesian economics works. Now every time new money is printed what is happening? There is this additional 1 crore rupee that has been generated. Now as a result if there is more supply of anything including that of money, if more amount of money is present in the economy, what happens to your 5 lakh? It goes down in value. 
So that is precisely what happens at a fundamental level. And when you see the income disparity growing big between rich people and poor people, this is one of the key reasons that a poor person is unable to access debt. And in majority of the cases, they don't even have a bank account. And rich people like Jared Kushner, they end up amassing crazy amount of debt at dirt cheap prices. But while we can't change this situation, the important lesson that we can learn in order to migrate from middle class to upper middle class or rich class is fairly simple, that whenever we are taking debt, we should use it in order to create a cash flow. Now, the second key reason why people get stuck in the middle class is that we have a very bad or very poor risk appetite. Now, what is meant by risk appetite? For example, let me demonstrate it by picking a couple of examples and please do not take it personally. This applies to my parents also. So for example, if we have grown up in the middle class, one of the key things that you will be pushed at is that, hey, go do engineering because it is safe. Go do Sarkari Nokri. Why? Because it is safe. Aapki life safe ho jayegi and you will get settled. So right from a very young age, we are conditioned not to take risk or eliminate risks completely. Now that is a really, really bad framework, especially in this day and age. Because if you're not taking risks by the time you're 20, 25, then growing up, it will become harder and harder for you to take risks. Why do we not take risks? Because we have zero understanding of what type of framework to use in order to take risk. So if you're thinking about whether to pursuing a career abroad, whether to pursue a certain degree, whether to go do your own startup, whether to go switch your job, this simple framework will help you out. So what you simply do is that you divide the framework into BCG two by two on one axis, you write return. And on one axis, you look at the effort required for that particular risk taking move. So for example, if you are making the decision of switching your job, now what is the amount of effort you would need to make? Now, depending on your situation, it could be low or high. For example, if you just have to send in, let's say 50 applications to 50 companies, probably the effort required is low. Now, if you make a switch successfully, then these days you know that people are getting a seven to 10% salary hike easily. So the return is high. So should you be making this move? The answer is absolutely yes, because the effort is low and return is high. So you should definitely be making this move, but people will keep on thinking about your, should I be applying? Should I not be applying? They will go and discuss with 500 of their friends. In such a time span, you could have already applied to 10 firms. If you just simply understood this basic framework. So this is point one. Point two, whenever you are taking risks, Think about the size of the investment also. For example, if you are making a decision of studying abroad, now this is a big decision. It will require a lot of upfront investment. So here you should use two simple methods. First is that what is the best alternate to not doing that step? For example, if you are aiming to study abroad, if you don't do that, then what is your best alternate of not doing that step? It could be that, hey, I'm getting into I am Ahmedabad or I am Bangalore, some good college, or I'm getting a wonderful job in India. Okay, then do a pro and con analysis. Second key point that many a times people just make very rash decisions that they would say that, you know what, we have just have to do it for whatever reasons. Even if the investment is high, dekh lenge aage chal ke. no, please sleep on your important decisions. Whenever you have to undertake a very big ticket purchase or very big ticket investment, please think about it. Please sleep on it. Please do not make emotional decision. This is not a push from my side to study abroad or not study abroad. I am just discussing a simple framework with you. Now, third and final way of making slightly risky moves in your life is to do 80, 20 analysis of things. Now, many a times and tell me in the comment box if this happens to you or not is that whenever you have a complex decision to make, almost 90% of the people will not make the decision at all. They will keep on pushing it or they will not take the decision at all. They will keep on thinking about it. So please apply 80-20 here. 80-20 simply means that if you have got 20% of the good data, please make a decision. You will never in the real world get all the data related to an information. Again, apply this to study abroad context that if you have to go study abroad, then people will debate important things first. For example, will I get a job? How much is the expenditure? What will be the lifestyle like? Now, these three are very, very important things. You can easily sort it out by speaking with five, seven people. Now people keep on worrying about 500 different things that you know what 10% of the class in this particular college does not get placed. Will I be in that 10%? How will you figure out the answer for this? 90% are getting placed. You're not looking at the 90%. You're only worried about the 10%. So that prevents us from taking a risk. And if you want to migrate from middle class to upper middle class or rich class, you have to take risks. 
Now comes the third and the most important point according to me in order to transition from the middle class to upper or rich class, which is expanding your mindset. Now, this is something that I have been a guilty of that I spent majority of my time in my comfort zone. I hardly used to try new things. But when I went to INSEAD, when I was roughly 26 years old, it changed my perspective. I got to meet people from so many different nationalities. Approximately, I have friends now from 75 nationalities, which is absolutely mind boggling. I learned about how they think about the world, what issues pertains to them, how do they make decisions and bunch of other softer elements, which did not create any immediate impact on me per se. But in the long term, it expanded my brain. Now you would say that Akshat, you know what? I don't want to go abroad, study abroad. All that is fine. What you need to do in order to expand your mindset, it's again, fairly commonsensical. Try to meet new people, try to go attend conferences, clubs, social events, whatever you can get access to, join those communities. Second, please visit new places. If you have a chance to go to Singapore or if you have a chance to go and visit any new country, please go explore it. Live immersively, live frugally. Go book a very basic Airbnb, try to speak with locals, try to aggregate basic knowledge. I am also trying to do more of it. It just expands your horizon. Third and finally, work on new skills. For example, if you are good at video creation, try to become a good writer. If you are a good writer, try to get into podcast. So try to pick up new skills because every skill that you learn becomes an earning potential for you. So I will leave you with three important tips in order to think about how to expand your brain. So first and foremost, please go out of your comfort zone. I grew up in a very small city. I always wanted to stay within my comfort zone. I hated traveling. I did not like trying new things. I was stuck in my comfort zone. So if you are stuck in your comfort zone, please try to pursue at least one activity a month where you are constantly pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. If you don't like speaking with people, just make it a point to speak with one new person every month. That could be the simplest start. Second key point, please do not develop a transactional mindset. Transactional relationship means that, okay, I'm going to go to this event only if I get certain thing in return. I will go and speak with this person only if I get certain amount of money. I will apply for this job only if I 100% get this job. Please do not live your life transactionally. That is probably one of the bad measures that we are taught that actually degrades our life. Third and finally, please learn on cross-functional things. For example, if you check my bookshelf, you will see that I read wide variety of books, be it philosophy, be it economics, be it finance, history. And I'm trying to make videos on these topics as well because all the learning coalesces together. Subjects are not individual. So please keep that point in mind. So three things that we learned in this video that if you want to migrate out of middle class, number one, please understand finance better. It is absolutely critical. Number two, please learn the art of risk taking. And third and finally, please actively work to expand your mind. The bigger your brain, bigger your mindset, the richer you will get. Becoming rich literally starts with becoming wealthier with your mind. So now over to the question that I started at the beginning that did I avail that EMI? The answer is yes, I availed that EMI, but I also understood the following points. Number one, there are associated processing fees and GST associated with these EMIs. So I'm okay paying it because still my net investment came out to be positive from that angle. Number two, I'm not a fringe customer. So this is a very, very important concept. What happens is that a lot of people are put on a habit of buying more and more and more stuff. For example, imagine this, that if you have to undertake an outlay of 40,000 rupee, it might be a very high ticket investment for a lot of people. So these are fringe customers. So they are put on a habit that, you know what, keep on spending 5,000 rupees a month, right? And today you can buy an iPhone. After 10 months, take another EMI, you can buy a laptop. And after 10 months, buy another refrigerator, whatnot, right? So I am not in that fringe customer category. It did not create any impact on me, but this is a habit putting thing. And therefore you must be really, really careful about EMIs. So therefore, please be very careful while taking EMIs because the companies that give EMIs, they become rich, but the people, majority of the people who take these EMIs actually end up being poor. So please change that mindset or at least understand the entire game behind it and only then avail these EMIs. I hope you enjoyed the video. Do check Tax Buddy and I will see you tomorrow.